Welcome back to the conclusion of our series that we've called Radioactive. It's about the, the power and the energy and the things that can be, be good but often become toxic for us. We have been talking about things that subtly contaminate, quietly behind the scenes, pollute our lives like, like toxic thoughts. That was week number one. You are becoming what you think about. Your thoughts are determining who you become. And so we talked about the idea of taking captive those destructive thoughts and replacing them with spiritual truth. We talked in week number two about toxic words, the, that your life is moving in the direction of the words that you're speaking. Your words are powerful. Uh, uh, the power of even a single word uh, can change things. Week number three, we talked about uh, toxic emotions. You may not be able to always control toxic emotions, but they don't have to control you. Your life does not have to be run by the, the way that you're feeling. Uh, last week we talked about toxic relationships. Your closest relationships determine the quality and the direction of your life. And so we have to uh, filter those relationships. In fact, sometimes we've got to set appropriate boundaries in those relationships. And even in rare situations, there are times that we have to cut off relationships that are toxic. Now, I know for some of you, this has been maybe a little revolutionary for you. You, you did not realize that, that you could train yourself, that you could change the way that you think, Romans 12 uh, instructs us to do, and, and replace those thoughts. Or maybe you didn't know your words were so powerful. Or maybe you grew up with, with, with just the example of making decisions based upon uh, your feelings. And, 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 and that was new for you to be able to think, I, I, there's something else that, that I can do. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about toxic behavior. And I want to define it with this picture right here because I think it sums it up. This would be the definition of toxic behavior right here. I mean, that, that's exactly what happens. Toxic behavior is often for us as clueless as this guy is, everybody else around him in protective gear, and, and he just seems to be oblivious to the fact. And so that's exactly what happens in, in toxic behavior. We're often unaware of, of, of just how... Uh, uh, just how powerful the consequences are of our actions. In fact, this truth I want you to write down. You are what you repeatedly do. Your life, you, your future is what you repeatedly do. The things that you keep doing. In fact, it's a biblical principle. Galatians 6, 7 tells us, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. It's just true from, a, from an agricultural sense, but it's true generally in life that the things that you do are going are, are gonna to reap more of the same. That, that whatever it is that you're involved with, you are going to get more of that. And what, what we're reminded is, is it's easy to be deceived about that. It's easy to think, well, it doesn't apply to me. It, it, it's not true in my situation. That's not, not really me. That, that's not, I, I, you know, I can do this. Uh, I can be involved in this behavior, but it's really not who I am. It's really not affecting me. And the universal truth here is, yes, it is. You cannot do things without it being a reflection of who you are. You are what you repeatedly do. And the things that you do, if you continue to do them, you'll get more of the same. Your actions have long-term consequences. In fact, your actions turn to habits and your habits eventually become your destiny. The very things that you are doing right now are determining your destiny and your character and your future. You are what you repeatedly do. But often we deceive ourselves. Well, what harm could that be? Well, what's the big deal? It's, it's really not that big a thing. And so we say things like, well, it was just, it was just one time. It was just 
one drink. Okay, this, don't worry about it. It's, we're just going to do it once. It's just one party. It's just one text. It's just one lie. It's just one dinner. It's just one night. And we kind of just excuse our, our toxic behavior and say it's not that big a deal. But the truth is toxic behavior has consequences. Toxic behavior will take you places that you didn't want to go, and it will lead you to do things you didn't want to do. You would have never dreamed you'd go that far. You'd have never dreamed that you would do that particular thing. You were just going to do that little bit. You were just going to take that one step. You were just going to go for just a while, but it took you to places you didn't want to go, and it caused you to do things that you didn't want to do. That is the nature of toxic behavior. In fact, we see example after example of it in the Bible. One of the first times we read about it is in Genesis chapter 13, where a guy named Lot, who is a relative of Abraham, does, does just a couple of little things. It's just one thing, but it ultimately leads in some, in, into some behavior that is going to get him into big trouble. In fact, in Genesis chapter 13, verse 10, we read that, that Lot was looking in the direction of Sodom. That's, that's all he was doing. He was just looking over there. He didn't want to go there. He wasn't planning to. It's just that he looked that direction. The next thing we read later in that chapter is that he pitch, pitched his tent near there. And so here he is now living close to Sodom. We read just another couple of chapters or so, and we find out that he is at the city gate. A couple of angels come through, and there's Lot. He's at the city gate, which means he's involved in, in the activities of the city. And then we read just a few verses later that as Sodom and Gomorrah are getting ready to be destroyed, the angels are having to drag him and his family out by hand. They didn't want to go. I mean, imagine, he, he wasn't even there, but he... He looked towards it, and then he, then he started living near it, and then he's living in it, and then he has to be dragged away from it. And that's what takes place in this thing we call toxic behavior. You look at it, you get close to it, you get involved in it, and then it's very difficult to get out of it. Toxic behavior is bad for you. Toxic behavior has consequences. If only we could see how bad the consequences are. In fact, a principal in a middle school tried to do that for a group of girls. She was the principal in this, uh, in this middle school where uh, some of the adolescent girls started, just had started wearing lipstick. And they would go into the bathroom and they'd put their lipstick on. And uh, then they would press their lips up against the mirror. And it made this huge problem for the custodian because the custodian would have to come in every day and there'd be all these little lip prints all over the bathroom mirrors. And it was driving the custodian crazy. She, the custodian was driving the principal uh, crazy. And so the principal called a meeting of all the middle school girls into the bathroom. Something had to be done. And she called in the custodian. And so she explained to the middle school girls what a big issue this was and how much problem it was causing the custodian having to clean the mirrors every day. And to demonstrate just exactly how difficult it was to clean those mirrors, the, 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 the principal asked the custodian to show her how it was done. So the custodian took out a long-handled brush, proceeded to dip it into the toilet, and then took that brush and scrubbed the mirrors down, scrubbing all those lip prints off the, the mirror. They didn't have a problem with lip prints on the mirror any longer. If we could see what our toxic behavior does, if we could just see how, 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 how difficult the consequences are for how filthy it is, the progressive nature of it, what it leads us to, we wouldn't be attracted to it as much. In fact, that's why the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 too, said this. He said, don't copy the behavior of the world. Don't mimic the things of the world. Don't just fall into what everybody else is doing. But it's sure easy for us, even as Christians, to do that. In fact, statistically, we, we read that Christians don't act a whole lot differently than just everybody else. And so maybe you've got a secret addition, addiction, eating, or drinking, or gambling, or shopping, or pornography. 
Or maybe your toxic behavior is going, going too far with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Or maybe it's stealing something or lying about something or gossiping about somebody. I mean, we, we probably all have some kind of toxic behavior that, that, uh, that, so, that sometimes gets the best of us. Why is that? Why do we keep doing that? Why wouldn't we know better? Why would we don't want to do those things still just kind of crop up in our life? And what I'm glad to find out is that we're not alone. In fact, the Apostle Paul, arguably the most effective uh, person in Scripture, the one that wrote a great deal of the New Testament, the maybe most famous preacher struggled with the same thing. Romans 7 talks about it. He says, I don't really understand myself. I don't get why I keep doing this, he's saying, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Maybe you can relate to that. The things that you want to do, you don't do. The things that you hate to do, that's what you just keep doing. He says, I do what I hate to do. He goes on and says, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. That's exactly how I feel. That's exactly how you feel, isn't it, sometimes? The things you want to do, you don't want to do. The things that you say, I am not ever. I've done, I'm not doing that. And then a few days later, a month later, sometime along the road, you find that you're back doing the same thing. You find out that you didn't want to do it, but you are. But if I do what I don't want to do, listen to what he says. I'm not really the one doing the wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. Apostle Paul says this is the issue. This is what's causing it. It's this sinful nature that we all have, that we all share. That's what causes us to do the things that we don't want to do and to not do the things that we want to do. It's sin living in us. See, the problem is that while you and I have accepted Christ and we believe that he's going to take care of our sin problem and he gives us forgiveness and he gives us freedom, at the same time, we're walking in this world and we're living in this body that still is subject to sin and it's so frustrating for us. And it was frustrating for the Apostle Paul still struggling with toxic behavior in spite of the fact that I'm a believer, in spite of the fact that I've been saved of my sin, in spite of the fact that I'm forgiven. And in spite of that, I still find myself being subject to the sinful nature, but it's not me that's sinning. It's the sin that's living inside of me. And so what, what, what the Apostle Paul is struggling with is the same thing that you and I deal with. And this is what I love. Just a few verses later, look at what he says. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Oh, what a miserable person I am. And my guess is that you have felt that. You have felt miserable just like Paul because you, you want to do right and you find yourself not doing it. And you're, you're, you're not going to do that wrong anymore. You're not going to follow with that toxic behavior anymore. You find yourself still doing it. And it makes us miserable. <coughs> it makes us, makes us miserable in life. In fact, I know people who have left Christianity, who said, I'm, I can't do it anymore because it, it just makes me miserable all the time. You know that word miserable right there? It doesn't just mean that I'm upset and I'm unhappy and I don't like what's going on. Well, that's a part of it. That word actually means that the situation is critical and it's beyond my power to change it. It's miserable in the fact that I can't do anything about it. It's miserable in the fact that I can't change this. And if salvation is going to come, if something is going to change in this situation, it's going to have to come from something apart from me because it's impossible for me. And that's what I love is when he says, who will free me from this life? Who will, who will give me freedom from all this? My life is dominated by sin and death. And look what he says. Thank God. The answer, that's what we want, is it? What's the answer to us being freed from this miserable part of wanting to do the right thing and not doing it and wanting to not do the wrong thing and finding ourselves doing it? The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the only one that can free us. It is not from you getting a little better. It's not from you trying a little harder. 
It's not from you going to church more. None of those things are bad. None of those things, uh, but them in themselves are not going to do what needs to be done. If you want freedom, it comes in Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is with his help that we can change our life. It is with his power that we can transform our lives. The answer to changing your toxic thoughts and your toxic words and your toxic emotions and all of that and your toxic behavior is through Jesus doing the work within you. You see, if you're a Christian, it's no longer just you living in you. It's Christ living in you. You've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer just your life. It's Jesus living in you. And Jesus makes you capable of doing things that you thought you could not do by yourself. In fact, you cannot do them by yourself. It's only through Jesus living in you. It's his presence in your life that allows you to have freedom. So what do we do about that? Here's a couple of things to take advantage of this very thing right here. The first one is simply this. Confess your toxic behavior to him. Oh, he already knows about it. But he wants you to acknowledge it. He wants you to admit that you've got a problem with your toxic behavior. And when we do that, 1 John tells us that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's what he wants to do in your life. He wants you to confess that you have a problem with toxic behavior, one that you cannot fix by yourself, and he wants to come in and he wants to provide forgiveness for you, and he wants to purify you. He wants to forgive your sin, but he wants to go beyond that. He wants to fix the sin problem in you. And so we confess that we've got a problem acknowledging that, which means I'm not going to deny it anymore. See, that's what we typically do when we have a problem with toxic behavior or, to or, or with sin. We want to deny that we've got a problem. Well, I'm not that bad. Well, there's a lot of people worse than I am. I, I'm, I really don't have any deep sin. Not just religious people do that. We all want to deny our sin. We've been doing it since the Garden of Eden trying to hide from God. What do you mean, God? What, we, we didn't do anything. Hiding, knowing that we're guilty, and denying and wanting to look good before God. And that's exactly what we do. We try to make ourselves look good. We deny that we have a problem. It's called denial. And confession overcomes denial by saying, I'm not going to deny it anymore. I admit it. I've got a problem, and I need something bigger than me to fix it. There's another form of denial, and that is when I say, I can fix my problems. I can do it myself. Oh, we're really good at this as church people. We don't want people to know. We don't want God to know. I can fix it. I can overcome this. If I just try a little harder, if I just do a little more, if I just read my Bible a little more, if I just pray a little harder, I can overcome this. And so step number two in this is saying, you know what? I can't do this on my own. I'm going to invite Christ to manage my toxic behavior. I'm going to I'm going to solicit him in this process of helping it, realizing that I can't do it on my own. I'm going to quit trying to do this myself. In fact, you have done that. I've done that. We've said, I can fix this. I can do this. And you find yourself repeatedly coming back going, I, I, I've messed up. I've blown it. I thought I could, but I can't. So quit, den quit, quit being in denial thinking you can fix this thing. We cannot fix it. It is only Jesus Christ who can free us from this miserable life. He's the only one that can do that. And so quit holding back on him thinking I can do it myself, trying to, trying to fix it yourself. In fact, that's what we do. We try to hold back these areas of our life and, you know, we're not going to bother God with it. We're not going to, we'll, we'll take care of it. This, and, and sometimes we like those areas of our life. We kind of hold off this toxic behavior because we, we like having an area that is our own and we can do what we want. And we don't want God involved with it. The truth is we cannot 
fix it. And if you try it with self-discipline, you will fail. You won't be able to do it because yourself is controlled by sin. And so you will keep sinning and you will keep moving in the direction of toxic behavior. And so you've got to ask the Spirit of Christ to come in and daily ask for his help in managing your toxic behavior. And then we also got to quit pushing the limit. And we've got to establish some toxic behavior guardrails. We're confessing our need for Jesus and inviting him into the process. But at some point, we've got to get smart about our toxic behavior as well. And we've got to establish some guardrails. You know what a guardrail is. It's that thing that's along the dangerous part of the highway. Maybe it's next to a drop-off. Maybe it's around a curve. It is to keep you away from that area, but not because that area is dangerous. It's because the, da the danger is, lies on the other side of the guardrail. And so it pushes back an area and says, don't even come to this Stay away from this area so you'll stay far away from the even more dangerous area. We need some guardrails in life, some personal guardrails in life that will keep us far away from the really dangerous areas, to keep us away, to give us some margin in life. If, if you go beyond this, it could get really dangerous. It's not dangerous here, but it's dangerous on beyond that. In fact, the Bible talks about guardrails for us. Paul says it this way, be very careful. Put some guardrails, some caution. Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. That would be a good idea, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I, mean, I think we all recognize that. We're living in evil days. There's all kinds of opportunities for us to be involved in sin, for us to get engaged in toxic behavior. Therefore, listen to this, do not be foolish. Don't go right up to the edge don't stand at the very edge of things. Don't, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't be foolish. Don't be stupid, it's saying. In fact, this is written to a culture that might have been uh, even worse off than, than our culture is. It was sexually driven, uh, even in that time frame. And, and, and so Paul is saying, you be careful then how you live. Actually, it says how you walk. Be careful how you walk. If you have dogs like I do, you have to be careful where you walk in your backyard. In fact, my nephew was over just a couple of days ago, had brand new tennis shoes on, bright orange tennis shoes. He was proud of them. I said, Ethan, be careful where you're walking. I've got dogs back here. And somehow or another, he ended up with, you know what, on his shoes. We've got to be careful how we live, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And so understand, face up to this. Face up to this. Embrace this fact that uh, accept God's plan for your life. Quit moving as close to the edge as you can. Quit going right up next to sin. Quit getting as close to sin as you can without sinning. Quit flirting like that and then saying, well, we didn't go that far. We didn't have sex. I didn't do it. It wasn't that bad. We didn't go that far. And ask the question, well, how far can I go? How close can I get? That is the wrong question to ask. We need to establish guardrails that keep us away from toxic behavior. You see, nobody ever plans to mess up their lives. But lots of people never plan not to. And so they just get close to whatever, and before they know it, they're involved with it. The truth is, you'll never regret putting up a guardrail. But you might regret not putting up one. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says it another way. Let us run the race that is before us and never give up. In fact, oftentimes the Christian life is referred to as a race that we are in. It's a long-distance race. It's one that we are trying to get to the finish. Let us run the race that is before us and, and don't give up on it. In fact, we should remove from our lives 
anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. You should do whatever you need to to remove things that are keeping you from running and finishing this race. In fact, you probably already know this. This refers to a a, a race similar to an Olympic event that was run uh, in the first century and had been run for for a long period of time. It was common for them in their intensive practice that they would take all their clothes off even, everything. I mean, not a race that you wanted to be involved with. They would remove everything so that there would be nothing that would get in the way. There would be nothing that would hinder them. It's with that picture in mind that Paul is saying, we're running an even more important race. And so remove anything that would get in your way, including any sin. What that means is sometimes toxic behavior is sin. Sometimes toxic behavior may not be something that the Bible labels as sin, but it just gets in the way. It just hinders us. And sometimes we want to say, well, it, that, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not, not a sin. It, the Bible doesn't say, I can't do that, but it's not helping you. And in fact, it more than likely is leading you into something will, that will eventually be sin plays out in all kinds of practical ways. You're a married person. And it means that you create some some guardrails that will protect your marriage and your purity. Maybe as simple as saying, I'm not going to have lunch with an old boyfriend or an old girlfriend. Well, that's, there's not anything wrong with that. Yeah, there may not be anything wrong with that, but is that the best thing? Is that the wise thing? Or is it a toxic behavior that could lead further? Or striking up a conversation on Facebook, just innocent. We just were talking. But you and I both know there are lots of people that their marriages have been ruined by just a simple conversation with an old high school flame that started on Facebook or Twitter or something like there. Don't go there. Don't go there. Quit quit justifying your toxic behavior by saying, well, the Bible doesn't say anything. There's not anything wrong with it. We're just friends. It was just once. It was, just, it was not that big a deal. Instead, remove anything that is going to get in the way of you finishing the most important race in life. Put away toxic behavior. Remove it. It, It's a constant thing. I I used to think that, you know, as you got older, as you got more mature, that that temptation didn't hit you as much. The truth is, it, it never stops. And it's something that we're constantly repenting of. It's something that we're constantly removing from our lives and saying, I've got to address this. I've got to be vigilant. I've got to remove this from my life. We've been doing all kinds of things with our radioactive bracelets, ask you to take all kinds of exercises with it, from switching it to snapping it shut to flipping it and releasing it. Some of you even cut your bracelets representing a cut in a relationship. And what some of you need to do with your bracelet today is simply just to remove it. To take very seriously this idea right here is to remove anything. Maybe this represents a sin in your life. Maybe some kind of temptation. Maybe it represents just some toxic behavior that you're saying, I'm going to establish a guardrail and I'm going to put it away. I'm going to remove it. I'm going to take away anything that is going to block me, hinder me from running the race and Maybe it represents you moving something from your life. Maybe it's removing a destination that you stop at way too often. Maybe it's removing a a website. Maybe it's removing a certain channel. Maybe it's removing a device from your home. What is it that you need to remove so that you can be wise? Not because it's a wrong thing. Maybe it is, but maybe it's not a wrong thing, but... Maybe it's the wise thing for you to do to remove anything from your life. See, Jesus wants to help you with your toxic behavior. We all struggle, every one of us. I, I'm the chief sinner, the chief toxic behavior person that's got issues. And Jesus wants to free us from that. We can't do it on our own, so we've got to confess that to him. 
and let his forgiveness come into our lives. And we've got to invite him to manage that for us because the truth is we failed miserably at it ourselves and it's only when we say we can't do it, Jesus, we've got to have your help that he wants to come on. But what we can do is we can put ourselves in a position where we establish guardrails that keep us from just foolishly walking into sin and getting any closer. Let's pray about that for all of us. Father, thank you so much that you free us from the miserableness of sin. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin that you offer, for the salvation. But God, we're praying that we would be people who would hate sin and, and love you enough to want to please you with every part of our lives. So God, help us to grow in you. God, help us to, to put away our denial and to invite you to come in and deal with the mess of, of life that we have. We invite you daily to come in and to work and to lead us through your Holy Spirit to reject sin and to follow you 100%. God help us in Jesus' name.